<coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> All right, well, we are we're taking a few weeks and we are asking the question, why can't we all just get along. And um, part, part, of the, part of the goal in this series is to, uh, is to look at some of the differences within, especially within Christianity, although today we're going to kind of go outside of that just a little bit. Um, because a lot of times we'll just, uh, we, we know that we have some disagreements and differences, and a lot of times we'll just minimize them and say all oh, those disagreements aren't all that big of a deal. Um, or we'll just say things like, well, let's just agree to disagree, right? Which is a good idea, but it sounds a whole lot easier than it is to live it out. Um, and, and so we've said every week, like, let's make sure that we understand folks that we disagree with, and then let's look for areas of agreement and things that we have in common. And so a couple of weeks ago, we, um, we looked at the difference between Catholics and Protestants and how um, kind of Catholics and Protestants approach faith and understanding and even practice and beliefs a little bit differently. Um, last week, we talked about... Um, Last week we talked about kind of um, beliefs of in this, this kind of interesting grouping of Presbyterians, Baptists, Calvinists, Reformed, like a whole lot of labels and groupings um, that, that folks generally in that camp um, kind, of, kind of would use to, to label themselves. And an interesting, kind of interesting thing happened. So after last Sunday, kind of after both services, I was, I was feeling something inside that just wasn't quite right. A little bit of uh, angst, anxiousness, and I was like, what, what am I feeling? Um, that maybe something even in my presentation wasn't just quite right. And, um, well, I, I got some, some good and helpful feedback um, from a friend who just, we regularly have some conversations about, like, wh- how do we go about, like, even big picture, this, 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 this person and I, regularly talking about, like, how do we help people who disagree to come to the table, have meaningful, respectful conversations, and walk away agreeing um, even if they disagree. And so I got some really good feedback from him. He said this. Um, he said, you know, if I were Roman Catholic the Sunday before, I would have felt respected. I would have walked away respected. He said, however, not so much this week. Um, because he tended to believe in that kind of uh, reformed theological perspective, or at least parts of it. And so in some of the dialogue, he said, you know, your sarcasm and your use of sarcasm pushed me away a little bit. I was like, wow, that's really interesting. And so I had to do, I was, this, this week had some self-reflection for me. Um, and, and I was thinking especially about sarcasm, which can kind of be my go-to defensiveness. If I'm feeling a little bit anxious or disagree um, with a different position, I'll go to sarcasm because that's kind of, you know, natural, nice, easy, passive-aggressive way to disagree with somebody. Um, I know. See, I'm trying to work through my own issues myself. And I recognize something about sarcasm this week. Um, when you agree with somebody and they use sarcasm, you think it's funny. When you disagree with them and they use sarcasm, it feels hurtful, passive-aggressive. Which means that even when we talk about some of our disagreements and agreements, um, it's not purely a rational, intellectual conversation that there are emotions getting involved. And, well, I, I realized, you know, even after just kind of reflecting about last week, that I'm actually really closely aligned practically how we do church and even mostly like theologically with a lot of our Baptist, Presbyterian, Calvinist leaders and friends. But I've also been hurt by some folks in that tradition and my own defensiveness and argumentativeness came out a little bit. And so I realized late this week, I was like, so here I am preaching to you all, hey, we just need to get along and work hard at getting along, but I was doing it in a way that wasn't promoting unity. Why can't we all just get along? Well, part of it is because I'm part of the problem. And so, I just realized even more so this week, like what we're trying to do is really hard. And it does not come natural, and it is not easy. Mm, God, you're going to have to help us with this. God, we want to understand people that we disagree with. We want to show respect to them as your precious created sons and daughters. Even when we disagree, God, you're going to have to help us with this. So today we're going to talk about what do Jews believe? As in folks who 
part of the Jewish faith. It even feels a little bit weird to say that. And so I asked a friend one time, I said, you know, sometimes when I refer to folks as Jews, um, that it feels like something a little bit inside because that, that label has been used um, as like anti-Semitism and used as a hurtful label sometimes. And so is it okay to refer to someone who believes in the Jewish faith to refer to them as a Jew? And he said, well, it depends on your heart. If you mean it respectfully, then use it. If you mean it as an insult, then don't use it. And so today, I'm going to use it respectfully, even though if you feel something, that kind of may be why. All right, so two questions that every religion answers. How do I get to God, and what do I do after that? If you would like to look and uh, fill in, we have some notes that you can fill in um, on the uh, ends of the rows here, and uh, there are some blanks and some notes. Grab those, whoever's sitting, I think they're this side, this side, and maybe on the other side. You guys on the third row, we... We messed with you a little bit this week. Change it up to keep you on your toes. Um, grab one of those, pass them down. There's pens in the rows as well if you want to fill in some blanks. Um, what, do, what does Judaism teach? Um, Judaism is the religion, the name for the religion of Jewish folks. And so um, here we go today. All right, now before we just jump right into that, we kind of need to, we're just going to step back just a little bit and ask the questions like, why do I even need God? Like, why do we even have religions? And, and you'll see why we're going to talk about this here in a minute. But um, so four, four kind of like reasons that religion and faith even exists. Number one, God controls my experience of the afterlife. And so heaven and hell. And we want to avoid hell, do whatever we can to try to get into heaven. And if God controls that, then we need religion, obeying God, worshiping God, doing whatever God wants so that we can have a good experience in the afterlife. But that is not the only purpose of religion. That is not the only purpose of our faith, believe it or not. When you think about who God is, well, there's some other reasons that we would need God and the value of religion and faith. Number two, I should surrender to the greatest being in the universe. God, however however you understand God, the primary description of God is that God, whatever your God is, is the greatest being in the universe. In other words, He's greater than you, unless you think you're God in which you believe you're the greatest being in the universe, and you're doing a pretty good job already of surrendering to yourself whenever you want to do. So good job in your religion there. Um, but if but whoever is the greatest being in the universe, I should surrender to that greatest, most powerful being in the universe. It just makes sense. There's religion. Um, number three, what do I need God? Well, I want to avoid curses and gain blessings and protection from the most powerful being in the universe. If God has power and God's power can influence my life and affect my life, if God can bless me with good things or he also has the power to curse me with bad things, I want to avoid the curses, get the blessings. Therefore, I need to obey this God, get on his good side, and get his blessings. This is maybe the category that we would put getting our sins forgiven, right? That I, that I know I've done wrong and I've disappointed and disobeyed this God who is powerful and he cares about how I live. I really want to get my sins forgiven so that I can avoid curses, get blessings. Number four, God's way is the best version of life. If God, however you believe him, is the greatest being in the universe, then as we believe in God, and as most religions teach in God, God is, has also the, the, the wisdom of the universe. And if I want to make better decisions and just enjoy life, um, the, the best lifestyle is going to be God's way since he has great wisdom. And so, four reasons for why I need God. And every religion, every denomination, every approach to God really needs to be able to answer those four questions of like, our religion works or is preferable or is the best one, however you want to go about it, because it answers these four questions. And this belief system is the best way to address all four of these questions. The afterlife, surrender, gain blessings, and wisdom, make better decisions, the best kind of life possible. Okay, this is really important because not all religions and even some Christian denominations focus on the heaven and hell aspect. And so a lot of us, when we want to kind of analyze what other religions and other approaches and denominations believe, if we just begin and end and everything is all about heaven and hell, then we'll misunderstand a different religion. Now, now that is not to say that heaven and hell are not important. They are important. Jesus talked a lot about both of them, okay? 
but we have to really be careful that when we try to understand a different group's belief systems, that we don't try to force and to kind of project our belief system on top of theirs and then interpret it only in terms of ourselves. Now, in the end, we can disagree, and we're going to disagree today. But we have to start with understanding how does this group believe, perceive, and promote life. Okay, so with that, now let's ask the questions, what do Jews believe about salvation and access to God? If the most basic questions are, how do I get to God? What do I do after that? What does, Ju- what does Judaism teach about this? Number one, heaven is the presence of God and will be experienced at varying levels of closeness to God. We just kind of assume, and this is really easy with Judaism, since as we're going to talk about later, Jesus was a Jew, um, the, the, the early, Christian, early Christians were Jewish, right? Um, but generally speaking, Judaism... Jews in general, don't quite see heaven and hell like we would see them, right? Um, Much of Judaism teaches that heaven is all about the presence of God and enjoying the presence of God, and that kind of like having where you buy your seats at the, the concert influences your experience of it by how close you are to the stage or the to the main actor. And so, that that heaven will be experienced by everyone eventually, but at different levels of closeness to God. Um, This this is not like different prescribed kind of of like levels, like maybe we're going to talk about in a couple of weeks or so, um, but it's just like closeness that's influenced by how you live your life, okay? But at the same time, number two, um, what what do Jews believe about salvation and access to God? That hell is temporary, and it cleanses a person before they go to heaven. And so if a person maybe goes to hell, they're there just a little while while they are being cleansed or purged of any kind of remaining sins, unrighteousness, that then prepares them for some level of closeness in heaven. But in the end, hell is temporary, not eternal. This then, number three, is really where Judaism begins to shine and put most of its emphasis. And that is, Jewish folks would teach and promote that we should give more attention to this life than to the afterlife. That God, he can be trusted for whatever our experience is going to be for the afterlife. The only thing we have any influence over is how we live here and now. And that as we read the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible, what God has told us is here is where you should put your time, your energy, and your focus, and that is how to live here and now. And so, com- 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 you know, a common belief then. All right, so then number four, how should we live here and now is this, righteousness and shalom. You'll hear a lot about shalom um, when talking about Jewish folks, and shalom is kind of, it, 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 when we translate it just quickly, it means peace. But it's more than just like the absence of conflict. It's more than just like world peace when there's no wars. Really, shalom, peace, is like this deep inner sense of like inner peace. But it's also like general whole life well-being. One of the words that a lot of folks are using these days to talk about shalom is flourishing. I love that word. I love that kind 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 of sense of it. That when a person is experiencing shalom, that they are flourishing. That when a relationship is defined by shalom, it's the relationship and the people in it are flourishing. When a family or a nation is experiencing shalom, peace, that nation, that family is flourishing. And for the most part, everybody in it is flourishing. And so that's kind of the focus is what can we do? How should we live? What decisions should we make? so that we can experience shalom. And as God would say it, you only experience that shalom when you're living in righteousness, when you're living the right way, doing the right things, believing the right truth, as opposed to the wrong way and untruth, and the right way and righteousness is God's way. And so righteousness and shalom are experienced through a covenant with the one true God. And that word covenant is really, really important because that is really the starting place if you want to understand what is Judaism all about. Because Judaism comes about, as we looked at last fall, through the story of Genesis, when God finds this man named Abram, and he says, Abram, 
Move away from your family, your extended family. Go to the place that I will give you, and I will form a covenant with you. And he comes back time and time again, and he says, well, I'm going to form a covenant with you. And, and Abram knew what a covenant was. You see, living in, in clans and tribes and kind of extended families who were basically nomadic, they recognized that they were vulnerable to attacks of the enemies. And so what, what clans and tribes would do is they would move close to an established city that had strength and power and a wall around it so they had some protection. And if they were really lucky, they could get in good with the ruler of that city who would offer them a covenant. And the covenant would go like this. In the time of need, I, the king, will protect you. When the enemies attack, you and your family and your clan can move inside the city and can enjoy the benefits of protection and flourishing from the city. You can enjoy the protection and, all the, and, and the benefits that come from being in the city, although you don't have to live here all the time. And so we will protect you, we will take care of you, but you'll pay taxes, you'll help out when is needed. This is a two-way agreement. It is a relationship. It is a covenant. More than just a legal contract, although there are terms and conditions for both sides, it is a covenant. But really the king was giving more and offering more than the person benefiting from the covenant. And when God enters the covenant with Abram and Abram's people, he says, I'm going to change the conditions even more. I, God, I'm going to take most of the responsibility, but I'm going to offer you a covenant and if you, will, if you will submit to me as your Lord and as your ruler, I will protect you. I will take care of you. I will bless you. You obey me and live for me and give me your 100% allegiance. It's a covenant. Okay, you understand that? And so just like they would make a covenant with a king in a city, God says, I want you and your tribe and your clan and all your people after me to make a covenant with me. And I'm offering this covenant the question is, will you live as a son or a daughter of the covenant? That's the question. And if you will enter the covenant, say, yes, I will be a son of the covenant, a daughter of the covenant. And that's the language in Judaism that they would use, to be a son or a daughter of the covenant. If you will be a son or daughter of the covenant, then you will enjoy God's protection, God's blessings, God says, you will also live my way. You will surrender to my law. But what do you know? Since I'm the greatest being in the universe, remember those things we talked about earlier? By surrendering and by obeying my laws and my rules, you will also make better decisions because my laws, my rules, they're just the path of wisdom. And so the offer then to those who would call themselves Jews later on, but starts with Abram and his family is, will I, will we, live as sons and daughters of the covenant. That's the next section. So what does it mean to live as a son or a daughter of the covenant? Well, number one, very simply, obey the laws or the rules of the covenant. And so the Ten Commandments, as we read them, they are the basics of the covenant. A, a basic kind of like, here are the laws that I want you to, 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 to live and worship me alone. Don't make any other idols. Um, observe the Sabbath day. Keep it holy. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not commit adultery. Do not covet. You know, there, there's 10 of them. Um, but he said, but that's just kind of like the summary 10. There are, you know, well over 600 more of them that govern every part of your life because I want you to live a wise life. I want you to treat each other well. And so all those laws have to deal with how we treat treat each other, how we treat God, and how we worship, and how we form our society. And those laws and the covenant took care of every part of life, our social lives, our society, our worship, and even our marriages, parenting, interpersonal relationships. And so if you're a son or a daughter of the covenant, you will obey the laws or the rules of the covenant. Number two, there are a lot of laws. So what happens when we mess up and I don't obey or I disobey the laws or rules of the covenant? Well, then you repent. You repent for breaking the laws of the covenant because you have not only hurt somebody else if it's one of those interpersonal laws, but you've also offended God every time you break one of the laws, the rules. We call it sin. Repent and don't do it again. Because true repentance is indicated by not repeating the offense. And so get serious. And if you mess up, repent and don't repeat. 
But what if I just can't help it, can't stop it? Oh, now we've got some spiritual trouble. Jesus is going to come on along later and talk about that. But right now, we're not talking about Jesus, okay? Number three, seek forgiveness through animal sacrifice at the temple. So it's not enough just to say, God, I'm sorry, God, I'm sorry, and I promise I won't ever do it again. Cross my heart, hope to die. He's like, hope you don't die, but you did sin. When you sin, go to the temple and offer the animal sacrifice, which everybody in their era would have understood animal sacrifice, and it wasn't creepy, it wasn't weird, it didn't feel like bloody, weird, violent, like we look at that and we're like, I do not understand. Part of why we don't understand animal sacrifice is, is uh, because culturally we're just removed from even like that level of contact with animals, but it was completely normal in their societies, especially ancient societies, okay? So the way to seek forgiveness is through animal sacrifice, or as the Jewish people figured out, discovered, or came to the conclusion when they were living in ex exile in Babylon and there was no temple, there was no tabernacle, there was nowhere to make an animal sacrifice, they realized the best sacrifice that they could offer was to gather in a synagogue and pray and pray and pray and study scripture. And so to understand Judaism, you kind of have to understand the difference between temple and synagogue. And the difference is sacrifice. At the temple, there is an altar by which you can sacrifice, and there are priests who offer the sacrifices to God. In a synagogue, by, in a synagogue, there is no altar, there is no priest, therefore we don't offer sacrifices. There is one temple, only in Jerusalem. There are lots of synagogues. In fact, in any city in which there are 10 Jewish men, you have enough to form a synagogue. A gathering place. At a temple, you offer sacrifices. At the synagogue, you pray and study scripture. Right now, there is no Jewish temple in Jerusalem. So right now, and for the last 2,000 years since the temple was destroyed by the Romans shortly after Jesus, there have been no animal sacrifices offered by Jewish priests there have just been there just have been synagogues and so how do we find forgiveness when there is no temple or sacrifices through prayer and scripture study at the synagogue and we pray and we trust and we hope that god indeed does forgive even though we can't offer a sacrifice and number 4 what do we do how to live as a son or a daughter of the covenant observe the sabbath observe the holidays and observe the rituals we're going to talk about that in just a moment and then number 5 live and worship in community with other members of the covenant. Another reason it's really hard for us, um, especially kind of us Westerners, to understand Judaism is that we approach faith from mostly an individualistic um, per, uh, perspective, right? And it's really important because we just really believe that every one of us has to make a personal decision whether or not to follow Jesus. And your faith is determined by your personal decision to follow Jesus. Judaism is much more corporate. Like God, we are saved because God chooses to give his covenant to a group of people. And so by becoming a son or a daughter of the covenant, you need to make that individual choice, but, by, but, but you're joining the community that God has chosen to save. And so there is a much more communal kind of a focus in Judaism and less of an individualistic approach than there is in um, traditional, right now as we experience it, Christianity. And if I'm a member of the covenant, then I'm going to do all these things that we said earlier. Obey the rules, offer the prayers, offer the sacrifices if possible, observe the Sabbath and the holidays and the rituals. Okay, so what are some of these Jewish practices and rituals? Um, got a couple pictures that I can kind of show you because um, pictures help to understand um, life, life and lifestyles and they're, they're a little bit different than ours. Okay, so some of the Jewish practices and rituals. Um, how about when it comes to worship? A couple of uh, uh, ways that we said a little bit earlier. So you could experience um, sacrifices at the temple or study and prayers at the synagogue. Now, why did I show a picture only of a, um, of, a, of a model when it comes to sacrifices? Because, as I said earlier, right now, there is no 
uh, Jewish temple right now where sacrifices are being offered, and so um, that is a model. However, right now, these are live, real pictures of folks studying and praying at the synagogue. Okay, about rituals. Uh, The ritual of circumcision. Sorry, no picture for that one. Go back. This is not circumcision. Back it up. Okay, sorry. That, that, I wasn't able to pull that one off. Okay, however, um, bar mitzvah and bat mitzvah. Bar mitzvah means I am a son of the covenant. Bat mitzvah means I am a daughter of the covenant. And so you have probably heard of this, uh, this kind of ritual celebration where a young boy or a young girl, having studied the scripture, publicly says... I'm a son of the covenant. I'm a daughter of the covenant. And one of the parts of the ritual is that they are able to read in Hebrew from the Torah publicly with their synagogue, in their synagogue with their gathering of their worshiping community together. Um, how about holy days? Um, Rosh Hashanah or the celebration of the Jewish New Year? There is Yom Kippur, which is the Day of Atonement. Notice intense study of scripture, wearing white. If there were a temple, this would be offering a sacrifice at the temple. How about Sukkot, the festival of booths? You can read about this in the Old Testament, remembering the days when Jewish folks were uh, were living in tents for the 40 years after Egypt before going into the Promised Land. And then, of course, the celebration of Passover, notice there, in a home around a family dinner. Right in the middle of it is the, um, is the, is the plate on which the uh, symbolic elements of celebrating the Passover are there. And then there are more um, celebrations, rituals uh, that, that form Jewish celebration. Okay, within Judaism, just like within Christianity, there are several different kind of movements or what we might call denominations that have different approaches and different emphasis. Um, The first one is the most conservative, what we call, um, or what is called, Orthodox Judaism. And so Orthodox Jews, and here's a picture of some Orthodox Jews, um, note especially the difference in in, in dress and kind of approach from what the picture you're going to see next. Don't show it. Just keep this one here right for a minute, okay? Um, So Orthodox Jews would believe that the laws and the traditions that we find in what we call the Old Testament, but they call their Bible— Those laws and those traditions are literal, they are unchanging, and they are obligatory. And so just like God said, this is how you are to live, and he gave it to, you know, know, long, 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 more than a thousand years before Jesus, that even today in every culture, those laws, those rituals are to be observed. They were literal. We should still observe them, live them, dress just like it said. They are unchanging, and they are obligatory, okay? That is Orthodox Judaism. Then there is conservative Judaism. Judaism. You can go to the next picture here. Okay, here's a picture of some conservative rabbis. Notice the difference, even in just what you see. Within conservative Judaism, um, would would say that the laws and the traditions, they're not literal, but they are subject to the interpretation of a rabbi, and they are obligatory. And so times have changed. We're living in a different time and a different culture, culture, and so we don't have to live those out literally, but they still do apply And they are subject to the interpretation of a rabbi who helps us understand how to apply those laws and those rules in today's culture, in today's time. And so you can see it just shows up in a little bit, in dressing just a little bit differently. The third movement is what is called Reform Judaism. I don't think I have a picture for this one, um, but but just kind of similar. Not not much of a difference in dress and how it kind of shows up, but in beliefs, uh, Reform Judaism would teach that the laws and the traditions are not literal and that they are subject to personal interpretation and application. And so the difference there is conservative Judaism say they're subject to the rabbi would interpret them for us. Reform Judaism says they're subject to personal interpretation and application. All right, a couple of other movements related to Judaism, but just enough difference that we should put them in a separate category that are movements related to Judaism, not necessarily movements within Judaism. Um, Kabbalah, you maybe have heard that before. Um, Kabbalah is a New Age, mystical, spiritual kind of approach to faith, religion, if you will. It's based in Judaism, but it's, was, wouldn't, a person wouldn't really call themselves a Jew. Um, but it is just mystical spiritualism, loosely connected to Judaism. How about Messianic Judaism? 
or what you might hear as someone might refer to themselves, label themselves as a messianic Jew. Um, these are Jews who believe that Jesus was the Messiah. We're going to get into that in just a moment. And finally, there's another kind of um, a movement, kind of a group of folks that we might call secular Jews or cultural Judaism or heritage Judaism. These are folks who are Jewish by heritage. They can trace their family ancestry um, within the Jewish community, but they're not religious. And, and, and for us kind of Jesus-following Christians, it's hard for us to imagine but for them, their Judaism is a matter of their heritage and ancestry, but not religion. Okay. Oh, man, that took way, way too long. I've not been watching the clock very well today. All right, so here's the big question that's really of most importance today. Is the God of the Jews the same God of the Christians? That's the question. What's the answer? Well, let's see. I heard a whole lot of yeses. Let's see. Um, well, what does Christianity teach? Number one, Jesus and the early church leaders, they were Jewish. Number two, the Hebrew or Jewish Bible is our Old Testament. Well, we believe in the Old Testament. We believe that it is the inspired word of God and that it is authoritative because it came from God. But imagine, just imagine... Being a Bible-believing, Bible-living person, but having no New Testament. None of it. How would that inform, and how would you live out? What would you believe, and how would you live it out? And all of a sudden, we're like, oh, so maybe we're not quite the same. Number three, what does Christianity teach? Christianity teaches that Jesus was the Messiah, the Son of God. We, we, we talked about this passage a couple weeks ago, but this really is one of those, this is one of those passages that you should have underlined, dog-eared, memorized, go back to it regularly, because what it affirms and what Jesus affirms is just so, so important. Look at Matthew chapter 16, verses uh, 13 through 18. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do the people say the Son of Man is? In other words, who, do the pe who are the people saying that I am? And they replied, well, some say that you're John the Baptist, others say that you are Elijah, and still others claim that you're Jeremiah or one of the prophets, one of those, in those Old Testament characters, right? But what about you, he asked. What, who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah the son of the living God. And Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not overcome it. We referenced this, where, this passage a couple, of, a couple of weeks ago when we talked about some of the differences between Protestants and Catholics. And Catholics interpret this as saying that Jesus is giving authority to Peter. You are Peter and on this rock of Peter. Where Protestants would, understand, would interpret this is to say that what Jesus was affirming is what Peter said, Peter's confession. Like that was the bedrock and that is the bedrock of Christianity. And to be a Christian, a follower of Jesus, is to affirm what Peter said when Peter said, You, Jesus, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus says, yes. In fact, why don't, you just, why don't you just read this with me? I think we have that verse on this next slide, verse 16. Do we have it available there? Come on, read this with me. Here we go. Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Okay, now here's why this is such a big deal. It is because, it's because one of the core beliefs for Jews is that there is one God. And coming out of a culture where everybody believed there were multiple gods, this was radical to say, nope, there's only one God. And for a group whose core belief is founded on the belief that there is one God, then anybody who claims to believe in another God is a false teacher, and anybody who claims to be God is a blasphemer worthy of execution. 
Jesus, being fully human, should have corrected Peter and said, wait, 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 wait. The first part of that, I'm the Messiah. Bingo. Second part of it, I'm the son of the living God. Peter, that's blasphemy. How dare you? But he doesn't. He says, Peter, good job. And this is so radical of a truth that you could not have thought this up on your own. It has been revealed to you by God alone. Jesus was, in this core, core teaching of Christianity, Jesus was the Messiah, the Son of God. Number four, teaching of Christianity, that Jesus' death on the cross was the fulfillment of Jewish sacrifices and was a once and for all forgiveness for every human being who will ever live. Jesus' death on the cross was not just the death of a martyr or a political, religious, um, you know, experience of oppression. He was killed because of what he believed. No, that Jesus' death on the cross was intentional and that all those Old Testament sacrifices at the temple, they were like an object lesson that pointed to Jesus' death on the cross. And so this is why Jesus is sometimes called the Lamb of God. And that when Jesus died on the cross, his death was the ultimate sacrifice for our sins that provides forgiveness. It was once and for all. He doesn't need to be forgiven. He doesn't need to be crucified over and over and over. It's, it is sufficient for everyone who will ever live on earth to provide full and final forgiveness of their sins. Number five, Jesus' resurrection forms the basis for our future resurrection and our eternal life to God. And therefore, Christianity clearly teaches, number six, that access to God comes only by trusting in Jesus Christ alone, our perfect final sacrifice. Number seven, obedience to God is necessary, but it comes as a result of faith in Christ, but our obedience to Christ does not save us. Jesus Christ saves us, and faith gets that salvation. Obedience is a result of it, not a cause of our salvation. And number eight is reality. Jesus, therefore, is a stumbling block for those who refuse to believe. This is crazy, that God would become a human and die for us and forgive all of our sins, be crucified, and then resurrected three days later. To say, I believe in all of that, that's a big step. For Jewish folks who were raised saying there's one God, he is in heaven, to say that Jesus is that God was a stumbling block. And so the result are some significant differences between Christianity and Judaism. Because the core of Christianity is who Jesus is, the Son of God, and the meaning of what he did dying on the cross for us then to reject both of those is to reject God. You know, this is the point. This is, this is, this is pretty, um, it's pretty controversial, right? Did you hear what I just said? Thinking about who Jesus is, the Son of God, and what he did, died on the cross for our sins. To reject those is to reject God. And because Jewish folks reject that Jesus was not the Son of God, and they reject the claim that he died on the cross for us. They have rejected Jesus, therefore they have rejected God. And so it is a fair statement to say that Christians would say to Jews, because you have rejected Jesus, you have rejected God. And likewise, Jewish folks have, and they do say to us Christians, because you have accepted Jesus, you have rejected God. And so the question, are Jewish folks going to heaven? I mean, this is a tough one, right? Because Jesus said and claimed that he is the only way to the Father. That heaven is the experience of the Father. And if you reject Jesus... You're rejecting the Father. And so we have some significant differences. At the same time, what can we learn from Jewish folks? First of all, the importance of studying Scripture. Do I admire 
our Jewish brothers and sisters and their love for God's word, their devotion to God's word, and their study of God's word. It is amazing and awesome and serious and focused, and we are wise to take note. And number two, we can learn and be inspired by the importance of life on earth. Too often, we Christians, we go the opposite way, and we just like, well, you know, life on earth is really short, eternity is really, really long, so let's put all of our emphasis on eternity and just forget about life on earth. It's not even important. In fact, some of us believe the whole thing's just going to burn up. It's going to be gone anyway, so none of it really matters. And Jesus is like, no, like, eternity is really, really long, and so it really matters, but how you live now, how you treat each other now, life on earth is also really, really important. All right, so how should Christians respond to Jews? I've got to go really, really fast. Number one, recognize the perceived arrogance of proclaiming that Jesus is God, the Messiah, and the only way to truth in heaven. Do you realize, do you realize how arrogant of a claim that is to someone who doesn't believe it? Hey, Jesus is God. Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus is the only way to truth in heaven. Now, I believe we can say it without arrogance because arrogance is an intention. But if you don't believe that, that is heard as arrogance and we need to recognize it. We don't have to back down from it. We don't have to be silent from it. But we need to recognize the perceived arrogance of that claim. And when you know and when we know that someone who hears us will perceive arrogance that doesn't exist, that is even more reason for us to be humble to really watch our lives and make sure, number one, that our lifestyle, our words, and our actions match our claims. And if we are going to believe in the bold claims about Jesus, we've got to make sure that we live like Jesus. Because if we don't live like Jesus, then we're denying what we claim to believe. The solution is not to just stop proclaiming Jesus. The solution is to start obeying Jesus. I hope that you're feeling, as followers of Jesus, the pressure of that. I don't mean to shame us into it. Too much pressure. We've got to understand that if we're going to claim Jesus, it's really important for us to give the time and the energy to make sure that we're obeying him. Number three, it is important for us to acknowledge our, our dark history of persecution. One short, against the Jews. One short story, about a thousand years after, uh, about a thousand years after Jesus, the city of Mainz was the site of the greatest violence, with at least 1,100 Jews and possibly more being killed by troops under the leadership of church and folks claiming Christianity. One man named Isaac was forcefully converted. But later, racked with guilt, he killed his family and burned himself alive in his house. Another woman, Rachel, killed her four children with her own hands so that they would not be cruelly killed by the crusaders who were saying, claim Jesus or we'll kill you. Now listen, don't you say, oh, well, that wasn't us, that was a long, no, 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 if you're a Christian, that, that's us. And no, you can't change it because it happened a long time ago. But what you can do and what I can do is make sure that for how I treat people and how we treat people, that it's consistent with how Jesus treated people because it matters. And the last one, worship team, why don't you guys come on back? We're going to pray here in a minute, and then we'll go. The worship team will play, pray as, uh, we'll play as we're going. But here's the last one. How should we treat and respond to Jewish folks? We should weep we should pray, and we should reach out in love. Let me just end with a word of scripture here. Jesus is riding into Jerusalem one week before he's going to be executed, crucified, rise again. He's riding into Jerusalem. It's his triumphant moment, right? He is being celebrated as king. And what is he doing? Basking in all the glory? A little bit. But then he gets to Jerusalem, And look at how he responds. Luke chapter 19. As he, Jesus, approached Jerusalem and he saw the city, not basking in his glory, 
Here's what he did. He wept over it. And he said, if you, even you, O Jerusalem, if you had only known on this day what would bring you peace. But now... You've rejected it for so long. You've rejected me for so long. Now you can't even see it. It's hidden from your eyes. And he weeps over Jerusalem. He weeps over Jewish leaders and Jewish people who rejected him for so long. They were absolutely close to the peace that he had offered them. What if our treatment towards folks we disagree with, especially folks who are not followers of Jesus, is not one of arrogance, and boasting, but one of weeping, of praying, and reaching out in love, just like Jesus did. Come on, pray with me. Jesus, help us. In our own angst, and our own anxiousness, in our own defensiveness, that for me comes out in sarcasm, for others it comes out in a host of other ways. God... I pray that those emotions would not rule the day in our lives. But Lord, that we would be faithful to you 100%. And that towards those who don't know you, Jesus, our, our posture would be one of weeping and prayer and reaching out in love. Jesus, teach us how to love people like you did. Teach us how to reach out to people like you did. Teach us how to live the truth and speak the truth like you did, Jesus. We need your help. We can't do it without you. In your name we pray. Amen.